Well, hello. Good evening, friends and neighbors, neighbors and friends. Um, good to see you. It's Tad. Um, I'm here. I will be reading for about the next hour, roughly. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything super important to pass along tonight. Just the usual. Um, I mentioned, for those of you who were, weren't here last night, I mentioned that I finally got a cortisone shot in my wrist. So I'm hoping... Uh, tomorrow to start typing full time again in the way that I normally do, as opposed to the two or three minutes of writing an email now and then having to go back and <laughs> put ice on it or something. Um, we'll see. It does feel a bit better, so I am in a better mood because of that. Um, and uh, what else? We're just in normal post Halloween mode. We had a nice Halloween. Um, as I also mentioned last night, it was the first time in about 20 years or more that I have been um, able to hand candy out to trick-or-treaters, which was, uh, you know, a big deal because, you know, I'm, Halloween has always been a favorite holiday of mine. And yet, because of where we've been living, which is uh, up in the hills in two different houses over that time, um, we never really could hand out um candy because no kids would come to our scary street up in the hills where it's all dark and there's no sidewalks and no street lights and the houses are you know oftentimes a couple of hundred feet back from the road and you know it just it's not a place that tends to draw little children and it's probably just as well um, not that we would have done anything to them but you know I mean it's not really uh, the kind of neighborhood you would want your kids wandering around and just because it's up in the middle of nowhere and we have coyotes and bobcats and even occasionally a mountain lion so um, that's uh, not the kind of place you want to turn your kids loose with a with a bag full of sugary sweets and say we'll see you in a few hours kids so anyway, it was good fun being down here in the flatlands and being able to hand out candy to uh, children of different sizes, not just small children, big children, medium sized children, all kinds of children. And um, actually figured the candy right, which is always difficult because if you're like me and if you were raised by my mom, especially you have a deep seated horror of ever running out of things to give to people. And that's whether that is Halloween candy or Christmas presents or food at a family dinner that that was like my mom's worst nightmare was not having enough so we always as a family err on the side of getting too much or having too many or whatever the case may be and um, in this particular case uh, we, we did all right we did all right we had enough candy for everybody and a little bit left over um, so hey success. What else? Um, as I mentioned, I have not been working for most of the last two plus three months anyway, in terms of the, uh, physically typing, because I just could not, it was just too painful. Very frustrating. Um, very frustrating. I am not good at not making things. I need to make things. Otherwise I feel a sickening disproportion between the media that I take in and what should be going out. <laughs> you know, in the sense of the, the give and take of, of real life. Um, I'm a big, I have a big strong feeling always that I should be making things. Um, that's not because people tell me I should. That's, and I'm not asking for people to say kind things to me. I'm just saying I, that's why I got into this kind of racket in the first place. Um, when I was young, I had only a few goals, but they were mostly centered around wanting to make things for, for a living, um, creative things, you know, whether that be drawing or acting or, uh, writing as it turned out or music. And as a result, um, that has always been a super strong part of my character. Uh, 
<laughs> along with the desire to be able to sleep in as late as I want to, stay up as late as I want to, and wear the clothes that I want to wear when I want to, um, because I had many years of wearing suits and ties and stuff like that when I was first in the working world. So, um, oh, by the way, speaking of, here, let me just show you this, because I know people always ask about what shirts I'm wearing. Um, and this is my Palo Alto High dropout. And yes, I did go to Palo Alto High School. No, I did not drop out. And this was given to me by my friend Rick, who also didn't drop out. But we certainly missed a lot of the last few years of our tenure there. Hey, it was the 70s. Um, enough said. Anyway, so what was I rattling and babbling on about? So anyway, so yeah, so it's been a tough few months and I had just gone through this before COVID um, because I had a shoulder operation which got put off for months and months and then I finally had it and then I had months of recovering and again, couldn't work and I was just going nuts and um, that's one of the really good things about doing what I do for a living. I can't guarantee people will always want to read what I'm writing, but at least I know nobody will be able to tell me, stop doing your job. Here is, uh, you know, here is your, your goodbye party and here we have this cake and blah, 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 and don't let the door hit you in the ass on your way out. Um, I will work until I'm dead probably, or failing that until I don't realize I'm alive, <laughs> however that works out. Um, so, you know, thank goodness, because I still think I'm capable of doing good work, and, um, and I need to. I need to. I'm sure many of you are the same way, whether it be with a specific thing like a, a creative thing or a um, crafting or whatever, like my wife, Deborah is much the same in the sense that she must work. It's a big part of her personhood and who she feels she is. And she gets kind of sick, um, you know, in the sense of not feeling right if she can't work on things and if she can't express her creativity. So I'm sure there's a lot of you out there like that and, and you understand very well how that feels. But it's been a difficult last three months because I've got things stacking up. I've got Ordinary Farm, I've got The Splintered Sun, I've got, you know, some other projects that I'm interested in and they're all kind of sitting there like airplanes waiting to land um, because I haven't been able to type for more than a couple of minutes at a stretch. And then, as I said, I have to go and put ice on myself or lie down or something. So. It's very nice getting back to that, um, which I hope, I mean, I'm not there yet, but it definitely feels a little better and it's not painful at the moment, which is what it has been continuously for months. Um, this is my wrist, but it's, it's everything. How, how, how much is too much information? I've probably already given too much boring information about my health stuff. It, it's, I have a lot of inflammatory stuff. And when one joint goes, the whole, the whole system goes kaboom or kerplunk or kaput. And, you know, everything gets inflamed and everything hurts and everything is difficult and blah, blah, blah. So sometimes just cooling down the worst area um, turns off some of that, um, not just the inflammatory system, but the immune system, the resistance systems, which get overamped and get crazy. So sometimes if I can just turn one thing, the worst thing off, everything else starts to slowly calm down. So I will know over the next few days whether that's working. But so far, so good. So anyway, let me see who might have popped in to say hello. Um, and who, all right. Oh God, Facebook, um, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Okay. So who's here? Harmony. Hello, Harmony. Good to see you. Angie, Angie. Yes, I should eat more dark berries. You're absolutely right. James. Hello. James says winter is coming. Um, <laughs> that sounds a bit ominous, but I'm sure it's true. I know it's true, in fact. Anyway, who else has checked in? Uh, Harmony, Angie, James, who I've all said hello to. Andre Stark. That's a name I don't know if I've seen before. Cliff, hello, Cliff. Good to see you. Deb Gates, hello. A pleasure. Kristen, as always, welcome. Becky, hi, Becky. Barb Ann, Becca, that's B-E-C-C-A, Becca. Tracy, good to see you, darling. Emily. Emily, good to see you too. Ray, hello, Ray. Um, by the way, 
that was a general Darlin. I tend to use, um, that wasn't a uh, directed at somebody assuming they're female or anything like that. Um, I tend to call everybody Darling and Sweetie, and we've got four kids, and I call all of them that, and one of them is transitioning, and, you know, it's, it, it's not a... a, a What's the word I'm looking for? It's not a gender-based thing. I call lots of people darling and sweetie. It's just something I've always done. I don't know. When I was 18, my friend and I lived in a cabin up in the hills, and we called it Hollywood in the hills. And, you know, I'm very Hollywood. So, that's <laughs> that. Darling, sweetie. Um, anyway, so who else? Who else are actually, have I not said hello to yet? Oh, bugger, stop that. <sighs> Come on. All right. So Kristen, Becky, I said hello. Barb and Tracy, Ray. Okay, that was the last one was Ray. Hi, Ray. Claudia, good to see you. Kelly, Mark. Hey, Mark. Carl and Christy and the mysterious three more. And I have no idea who those three are. I hope if I haven't said hello to you yet, it's because you were one of those three and you will just assume that I would have said hello if... Facebook would have bothered to give me the information. But, you know, that's how it is. That's what we have to deal with in the modern world is a surfeit of information except when you actually want it, at which point it um, disappears. Okay, so having babbled all this babble and having considered um, whether I have any other babble to babble, I have come to the conclusions that no, I am babble free now, or at least I am partially babble free. I'm mostly babble free. Um, I have offloaded all the pertinent babble, at least I think I have. Uh, basically, everybody's fine. Dogs are fine. People are fine. Uh, everybody is, if they're not actually in the house living with us, um, and therefore we're able to make sure that everybody's okay, then they are checking in with us regularly from where they are. So all of our inner circle family, as far as I know, are all well or were as of 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so um, no worries there. And I am going to start reading from The Witchwood Crown. And what we are reading right now is Simon and Miriam L. and Al Air and Tia Mack, although we haven't got to him yet and various others, including Morgan, the grandson, who we are just meeting in this book for the first time, or we have just met for the first time, because, of course, he wasn't around for the previous set of books. Um, anyway, these all of these folks are, have left Hernestir after having a very difficult time with King Hugh and his lady friend, Tilith, and... Um, for a variety of reasons I won't bore you with, and they are on their way across the Frost March, heading toward Rimmer's Guard to say a last farewell to Isgrimner, who is, Duke Isgrimner is now very, very old, and he is kind of in his last days or months or whatever. Anyway, so that's what's going on. Simon and Miriam L have been talking about that they are very sad, of course, that their son, John Joshua, died some years before but that they're very grateful for having their grandchildren, Morgan and Lilia, John Joshua's kids, a uh, little less chuffed, as the English would say, a little less excited, thrilled, however you want to re rephrase it, about their uh, daughter-in-law, John Joshua's widow, Idela. And so that's basically what's been going on. And at this point, Count Ailer, who is acting, who is the hand of the throne, meaning he is the... The, uh, the first minister, I guess you would say. Uh, Aelair has approached, and he is talking to, going to talk to them um, and has some information from home that has been sent along after them. And that's where we are, and that's what's going on. And after that long disquisition, I need a sip of something. <clears throat> okay. Aelair undid the flattened roll, and as Miriam L. had expected, immediately found the first thing he wished to discuss— several pages in. He prepared for any and all of his duties, no matter how small, with the anguished care of a general outnumbered and at bay. After much talk about the dedication of the new chapter house and the work on the library, as well as a few other matters I will save for later, like the League's complaint about Yisola's latest outrages, as they deem them, the Lord Chancellor, 
This is Passavales who sent the letter. The Lord Chancellor gets to the business at hand. Aylair's rueful smile pulled his strong, weathered features into a droll face, and Miriamel remembered when she had thought him perhaps the most handsome man in all of Ostenard. I do wish our friend Passavales could be persuaded to put the most important business at the beginning of the letter, but he still writes like a child of a provincial court, full of flowery greetings and formal phrases even in a dispatch. Aylair's eyes widened a little. Uh, forgive me, Majesties, I, I did not mean to sound as if I was criticizing the Lord Chancellor. He is an able man and a fine administrator, Simon laughed. You need not worry. We know you admire him. Indeed, your majesties are lucky to have him, and he will take good care of the Hayholt and Erkenland in your absence. But you were not so certain of that when we made the decision to travel to Rimmersgard, were you? Simon said. Come, I am teasing you, old friend. I know you are only doing your duty. It is a difficult thing to take away the king and queen from their court for so long. But we should get back to the business of Passivali's letter. Let me just read this to you, said Aylair, moving the heavy parchment until he found an appropriate distance from his eyes. But, my gracious lords and lady, he wrote, I fear the news from your great southern duchy of Daban is not so good, he began. He can be a bit wordy, our Passavales, can't he? Simon remarked when Aylair had finished. But the essence is clear enough, said Miriam L. Duke Salyaceris is struggling more than ever with his brother, and Drusus, as always, is champing at the bit to push the boundaries of Naban farther out into the thrivings. And the rest of Naban, also as usual, is waiting to see which of them wins the contest, as though it were no greater matter than a horse race. Drusus claims that he only wants to protect Nabani settlers from raids by the thrivings men, said Aylair. But that is the substance of the discord, yes, your majesty. I will summarize the rest of Passavali's points. He believes the desire to push out into the grasslands is too strong among the houses and Nabans dominate and in the country as a whole, for Duke Salyaceris to openly forbid his brother these aggressive actions. And he is also not certain that the Duke could survive an open struggle with Drusus in any case. Does he truly mean survive? asked Miriamel, alarmed for the first time. Surely these are mere disagreements. The Benedrivine house is the house of Camaras, the hero himself. And Salyuceris is the lawful Duke of Naban, not just by their own laws, but under our ward. By the love of the Saint Simon and I crown Salyuceris ourselves in the Sansel and Adonitis in front of God and all Naban. All true, said Aylair, and I do not imagine Drusus would move directly against his brother and flout so much law and custom. But assassination if it could not be directly laid at Drusus's door, would still make him the next duke, since Salyaceris's child is still a son is still a child. I hate to say so, but as your majesties know, murder has long been a favored method of gaining power in the South. Simon made a frustrated noise. Well, this is a puzzle, and no mistake. But what can Miri and I do? It would be heavy-handed to send troops to Salyaceris when he has not asked for such a thing. He looked around at the column of armored men marching behind them and the vanguard of mounted knights. Not that we have any troops to spare just now with the planting season hard upon us. Maybe Duke Osric is right when he says we need a larger standing force. After the king had paused long enough that it was clear he had finished his thought, Count Aylair gracefully took charge of the conversation once more. Let me be clear, majesties. Lord Passavales does not ask you for a solution at this moment, but merely wishes you to know what the news from Naban tells him, so that any change will not come as a complete surprise. In other words, 
said Miriam Mel. He wishes us to share his worry and his helplessness. Aylor frowned just the smallest bit. I'm afraid that is often a loyal subject's duty. In such cases, my queen. Mary knew she was being unduly cross, but the sun and the spring scents she had hoped to enjoy were fading beneath all these fretful shadows of statecraft. You look as though you are thinking hard, my clever wife, said Simon. You have been in the band far more than I have, and your family is still powerful there. What should we do? Miriam Al shook her head. Clearly, my Nabani kin are busy adding fuel to the fire, almost certainly for their own purposes, and I would not trust my cousin, Dallow and Gadaris, even to hold my reins for fear he would steal my horse. But there are still many other Ingadarines I trust. I'll, I'll write to them and see how things appear from where they sit and whether the fight between the brothers is as dangerous as Passavale suspects. We've already heard enough of this Drusus to think ill of him, Simon said. He's an arrogant, troublesome fellow, no doubt. But surely one man cannot provoke an entire nation into war by himself. It seems unlikely, said Aolair. But stranger things have happened. In any case, as your majesty's pointed out, we cannot send troops when they have not been requested. The Nabani would rightly resent it. And this is only one letter. Passavales is from Naban himself, so perhaps he feels it storms more strongly than the rest of us would. But when we return, well, perhaps greater attention to Naban would not go amiss. They are a numerous and often quarrelsome people. I beg the Queen's pardon if I offend. After a moment's silence, Miriam L. said, Offend? No, Aelair, I say it often enough myself. But we've barely begun this journey, and already I see troubles growing everywhere. The sun, though its beams still sparkled on patches of snow, and the sky was empty of clouds, seemed to have grown dimmer. I wish we were home. We all feel that way, my love, Simon told her, at least at times like this. He who always steps on sand, why did you lead your child to such a strange place? The gods of Tiamak's childhood in the Ran were nowhere near as powerful and ever-present as the deity his employers worshipped, but there were times he couldn't help thinking that a little closer oversight from them might still be in order, especially on this royal progress into cold northern lands. He pulled his cloak tighter. He would never become used to drylander clothes, but he was inexpressibly glad to have the right sort of garments for these chilly northern lands instead of what he had worn in the first part of his life, seldom more than a breech clout and occasionally a pair of sandals. Even thinking about what it would be like to cross into frigid Rimmersgard in such near nakedness made, made him shiver although several of the riders nearest him had taken off their helmets to enjoy the early spring sunshine. Sunshine, he thought. Back in our swamp, no one would have called such thin gruel sunshine. It is not hot enough here to lure even a cold turtle out onto a rock. It was not that Tiamak missed his marshy home exactly. Even in Village Grove, he had been an outsider a strange young man who had learned to read and write and had gone to Ansys Pelope in Perdruin to study. An actual city. But he missed the security he had felt as a child in the swamp, beneath the spreading branches and heavy leaves, when everything had been known and familiar. Now it seemed that the more years passed, the more strange the world became. Not too many years from now I will be truly old he thought. Will the world be completely strange to me then? Tiamak had never been this far north. That was part of it. Not only the cold air, but the very size of the sky seemed foreign. The broad expanse of blue so wide that he almost felt as though he stood atop some terrible high plateau instead of on a broad plain of streams and snow-dotted meadows. 
but the snow was finally vanishing with the warming days. Tiamak reminded himself. He should remember to say a prayer of thanks. At the same time, last year, as his comrades never wearied of telling him this part of Ostenard had been hip-deep in swirling, mounding snow, the skies gray as lead. So that is a good place to start with my gratitude, he told himself. Thank you, he who bends the trees. Thank you for any sun at all, and not too much snow. He might have felt differently, he suspected, had they not been called north by such a sad circumstance, the imminent death of Duke is Grimner of Elvritzschala. Had it been anything less, though, he would probably not have accompanied the king and queen. But his Grimner had been Tiamak's friend as well. Along with Miriamel, who was then only a young girl, they had faced impossible, almost unbelievable odds together and survived. That alone would have obligated Tiamak to travel to this unsettling part of the world. But over the years, his friendship with his Grimner had become something more, something completely unexpected. The sulfurous duke, big as a house, as he had first seemed to Tiamak, had proved to be as wise as he was loud and as subtle as he was brave. They had stayed in touch by letter, only a few per year stowed in the diplomatic posts that passed between Elvritzala and the Hayholt, but enough to keep the friendship very much alive. And, in fact, for most of that time it had been a three-part friendship, because his Grimner's wife, Gutrin, had always carefully gone through her husband's letters, adding in the words the Duke had forgotten in haste, correcting the occasional woeful mistake of grammar, his Grimner was equally bad in his native Rimmersbach, she had often told Tiamak, and adding her own comments full of useful news and funny stories about her husband. The news of Gutrin's death several years ago had been one of the saddest days of Tiamak's life. He had spent very little time in her actual company, but in her husband's letters, peeping out from between his scrawled lines, she had made a home for herself in Tiamak's heart. It was so hard to lose her, he thought. And now the duke, why does she who waits to take all back wait so long? Why must the reaping wait until we have grown so used to the world, when the pain will be sharpest for both the dead and their survivors? Tiamak adjusted himself on the hard carriage seat. He had not become so much of a northerner now that he liked to ride a horse, nor was he large enough to comfortably ride one for long, even if he wished. He had a donkey they kept for him in the stables back home, an unpleasant but reasonably steady creature named Scand. But there was no question of Tiamak riding the beast on this trip, where it would struggle every moment to keep up with the horses. Instead, the little man sat beside the driver atop the carriage meant for the king and queen, not that they had used it yet as anything more than a moving cabinet for their clothing and other belongings. Back at the Hayholt, Tiamak only rode scanned when he wished to be outside, and almost always in the company of young Princess Lilia and her pony. The royal granddaughter was nearly as pig-headed as the donkey, but Tiamak loved her in a way he would never have imagined possible, more even than he had loved his sister's children as much as if she had been of his very own flesh. It was not solely his loyalty to Simon and Miriamel that made it so. Tiamak liked the heir, Prince Morgan, well enough, but there was something about the little girl that pulled and tugged at his heart. And when she called him Uncle Timo, he was quite helpless. Even if there had been anything left for him back in the ran, even if the elders there had begged him to come back and be their chief, Tiamak knew he might not have been able to leave the little girl behind. He wanted to watch Lilia grow, see that clever mind fill with more and more understanding, watch her learn to put that powerful ambition to some higher task than simply forcing her slave uncle Tiamak to build complex water wheels for her in the mud of Kinswood streams. But losing his Grimner or missing little Lilia, were not the only sources of Tiamak's discomfort. 
When the news came to the hayholt about the duke, Tiamak had just begun his great work. Planning it had been the labor of years, but instead of seeing it finally come to fruition, he was here, a hundred leagues away from the castle and weeks from returning, knowing his work had all but stopped in his absence. And I am no longer young, he thought sadly. Who knows how much time I have to complete this sacred task? It was only a library, most people would say, a collection of books and scrolls, the kind of thing his Grimner himself might well have thought a strange waste of space and time. But it was to be the first true open library ever built in the northern lands, and to Tiamak, who as a child had wondered if he might ever own a real book, it meant the world. Conceived to honor Miriamel and Simon's late son, Prince John Joshua, the unfinished library was already precious to Tiamak, who had cared for that young man very much. John Joshua had loved books and learning as much as the Ranamen did, and he had ambitions to make it a great center of scholarship in the young prince's name. But until we return from Rimmersgard, I can do nothing to aid the work except send the occasional letter to the master mason and pray for patience. A sudden gust from the faded blue mountains to the north pimpled Tiamak's exposed skin, and although the wind had been blowing all day, the strength of this chill surprised him, pushing deep into his very substance, bones and innards. Without even thinking, he made circles of his forefingers and thumbs to repel bad luck, as he had done when he was a child. If I were back in Village Grove, he thought, I would be certain that she who waits to take all back had just breathed on my neck, reminding me that she has plans none of us know about. Which was true, of course, as it always was. He was letting sadness over his Grimner make him fretful, jumping at shadows, cringing from sharp breezes. While Tiamak was trying to gather back together his hopeful thoughts about the library, he heard someone come riding swiftly up behind him. He looked down from his high seat to see one of Aeolair's servants pacing the carriage on a tall, dark horse. "'Your pardon, Lord Tiamak,' the rider said. "'The Lord Steward bid me give you this. It came with the dispatches from Urkenland. Tiamak looked it over as Aeolair's servant rode away, and his heart lightened a bit. He knew who it was from instantly because of the odd seal pressed into the red wax. Instead of a heavy metal stamp or a signet ring, his wife, Thalia, always pressed a small dried flower into the melted wax. Because she had sent the letter several months back in Fayever, she had chosen one of the first wildflowers that bloomed in Urkenland every year, a bright yellow bloom called sun lion, or sometimes colt's foot. He knew she would have picked it herself as she gathered herbs and simples in the castle's gardens, and it should have warmed him just to see its sunbeam petals, still bright despite its long travels, but he was still feeling the effects of the chill that had surprised him a few moments earlier. He unfolded the letter and began reading, hoping for good news, or at least an absence of anything worrisome. Her opening words were in her usual conversational tone. Thalia seemed interested only in sharing various workaday matters, a few decisions on the library materials she hoped he would be able to write back about, and a question about wild marjoram and what he knew of its use in his boyhood home in the RAN. But then he reached the final paragraph. One last thing, my patient husband. A small but odd and interesting tale. I was called in your absence to practice physic on one of the kitchen workers, an old fellow of Hernesteri blood who had fallen into a fit on the floor of the buttery. I do not know if you know him. His name is Riggan, and he is a thin, gnomish fellow, threescore years old or even more, with large, bleary eyes and rough skin. He was not badly hurt, but his command of the Westerling tongue is poor, so I asked Countess Rona to help me. 
She asked him in his own speech what had happened, and he said, I hear the Moriga talking to herself every night, and I cannot sleep. Countess Rona looked a bit startled, I thought, and told me the Moriga was an ancient Hernesteri goddess of death and battle, no longer worshipped among her people, but still feared, still blamed for nightmares and other foul things. Then, before I could ask another question, this Rigan said something else in that tongue, and this is what I thought would interest you. His words were, She summons us back. She summons us all back. She is the silver-masked mistress of tears. Now, I ask you, husband, does that not sound as though the Norns Queen Utuku, once a real living menace to all mankind, has somehow become a demon fable for kitchen workers? The Sithi friends of the king and queen thought her power was utterly destroyed when the Storm King was defeated, and... I pray that is true. If she is now nothing but a legend, a fading nightmare, then I thank our merciful God for preserving us all from her evil. I did not want to spend long with this man Riggin once he seemed recovered, because he disturbed me more than a little, with his strange face and goggling fish-like eyes, and it was also disquieting to see calm, wise Countess Rona look so pale at hearing the name of the Morgo, the mother of all demons, as Rona named her. My Adenite sisters would call this man's malady the work of the devil, but my learning has been so shaped by yours, dear Tiamak, that I suppose it instead only the confusion of an illness of his mind, with tales he might have heard in childhood. In fact, I deem it proof of what you always say, my wise husband, Truth and falsehood walk a long way together before they go their separate ways. Had he received her message just a few days earlier, her tale of the kitchen worker's fit would have been a mere curiosity to turn over in his spare moments. But instead, this story of a madman who dreamed of the Norn Queen made Tiamak feel like a traveler abroad at night who hears something following him through the trees. On the night the royal party had left Hernestir, Count Aelair had told Tiamak and the king and queen of Queen Inawen's worries about Lady Tillith, that she and some of the courtiers were worshipping the terrible ancient goddess, the Moriga, and now here was that name again. It has to be chance, Tiamak told himself. Aelair himself had said that stories of the goddess were as old as Hernestir itself, but even as he soothed himself, his earlier chill returned, and this time without any cold wind to blame. The silver-masked mistress of tears. A deep dread clutched at his heart. Something is coming that will threaten all, he thought helplessly. My library, the royal children, the throne. I can feel it. He took in a long, shaky breath, his heart fluttering behind his ribs like a trapped bird. The driver flicked his whip to keep the horses together, oblivious to anything but the jingle of harness and the thump of hooves. The sky was still blue overhead, the sun still shone, but Tiamak felt as though he had stepped on what should have been solid ground and found nothing beneath him but yawning emptiness. Chapter 7, Island of Bones. By the way, I haven't checked in yet here to see if everything is rolling and rolling and rolling. Okay, so, okay, everything appears to be doing what it's supposed to. So that is all good, and I return to my story. Dun, dun, dun. Sorry, I thought we should have some dramatic music. Chapter 7. Island of Bones. The other four members of the Queen's Hand sat silently on the beach below, waiting for the ship to come. They had already waited on the graveled strand for hours, still as statues, while the wind strengthened and the afternoon died with the sun, 
and would likely sit that way without moving for many hours more. But Nezaru had never before seen the ocean. She had been so taken by its immensity, its vitality, its ever-changing surface and colors that she had climbed the cliffs above the isolated beach to get a better view. It was not only the size of the ocean that fascinated her, astounding as it was. The snowfields of the north of the great mountain, back home, seemed equally boundless. It wasn't the colors, either, as magnificent and unexpected as they were, the startling jade translucence of the waves, the grays and blues and blacks and ragged white caps. Because to Hikidaya eyes, the great ice fields of the Nornfels were full of color, too. No, it was the aliveness of the sea that stunned Nezaru, the constant motion in different directions, the intersection of wave against wave that could turn water into weightless froth and throw it high into the sky. And it was not just the water itself that was alive. Seabirds rose and sank on every swell or drifted above the waves in rotating clouds, their squawking cries filling her ears, filling the sky. Most of them were hunting the silvery fish that sparkled in almost every wave. Life was everywhere. Nezaru knew that if she gathered a sack of Nakiga barley the size of a house and dumped it onto the snowy ground outside her mountain home, not a thousandth of this array of living things would come to it. There would be crows, a few wax wings, and with nightfall the rats and mice, but the land around Nakiga could boast nothing like this chaos of noise and movement. She crouched on the hilltop and watched the sun dive down toward the sea, where it tipped the waves with copper. As the last sliver of the day star dropped behind the horizon, it flashed green, and as that moment came and passed, Nezaru happened to look down at the cliff face beneath her feet. Something pale sat only a few arms' lengths below her, shining in the day's last night, last light. Nezaru did not hesitate, but swung herself over the edge and then let herself down the steep rock face, testing each hold before giving it her weight, because the sandstone cliff was old and crumbling. In moments she was dangling by one arm and balancing on the ball of one foot beside a bird's nest, and its lonely occupant a single, pale, brown-spotted egg. A seagull's nest! she decided as she examined the frowsy accumulation of sticks and feathers and mud. Few gulls made it all the way inland to Lake Rumia beside the great mountain, but those who did were of keen interest to the Hikidaya and their servants, whose diets were always limited by the bitter cold and frosty ground of their native land. Nezaru knew very well both the look of a seagull's nest and the taste of the birds and their eggs. She carefully lifted the speckled thing, testing its weight. It seemed early in the year for egg-laying, but there was no question that something warm and alive slept inside. For a moment she considered taking it. Hand Chieftain Mako was very sparing with food. But after hours standing atop the cliff, Nezaru felt almost like a guest in this place. Also, the nest held only one egg, which made it seem something to be admired, rather than used. It was an odd feeling, one that most of her training refuted. But Nezaru gently set the egg back down in the nest. The light was waning as she climbed back up the cliff, the sky above her bleeding its violet into glow growing black. She paused to look out to the west, where the sun had sunk and the last light of day was fighting and failing. Far out on the horizon, so distant it would have been invisible to less keen eyes than those of the Hikidaya, she saw the pale geometry of sails. She glanced down to the beach, but felt certain that the approaching ship must still be hidden from Mako and the rest. As she scrambled to the top of the bluff, pleased to be the one bringing news, a swirl of air brought the sharp and sudden smell of danger. Nezaru peered above the edge. A boar had appeared, out for its evening forage. 
It was unaware of her, at least for the moment, but she knew that ignorance would not last long. At first, she thought it must be a large male, since it looked to be at least three times her own weight, with viciously sharp tusks as long as her fingers. But the scent and the time of year suggested it was an older sow, in which case it was probably protecting piglets and would be especially aggressive. Worse, to make climbing easier, Nezeru had left her sword and bow with her pack down on the beach. As she pulled herself onto more or less level ground, she slipped her knife from its sheath, although it didn't give her much confidence. A dying boar, pierced by a heavy spear, could still drive itself on sturdy, strong legs up the shaft toward its attacker and rip out a hunter's guts before collapsing. Nezeru had killed before, and not just animals, but wanted no part of this if she could avoid it. This creature had not sought her out. It might have young to protect. Still, the stink of the sow was powerful, even against the prevailing ocean breeze and its blend of complicated smells. If the creature had recently farrowed, it might not accept anything less than a fight to the death or Nezeru's running for her life. And a sacrifice did not run, especially not one of the queen's talons. It saw her. It will swing its head side to side to strike with those tusks, she thought. My knife is not long enough to reach its heart, but a well-aimed thrust might take it in the eye. Before she had time to finish the thought, the boar scrambled toward her. Oops. Before she had time to finish the thought, the boar scrambled toward her, back legs shoving hard against the loose, cold dirt, grunting and squealing as Nezeru dodged its first lunge. It turned on her again with such surprising quickness that she had time only to leap up and put her hands on its shoulders, hard bristles digging into her skin as she vaulted into the air. The boar threw up its snout to catch her as she went over, swinging its great head. The muddy tusks missed Nezeru's belly by less than a hand's breadth. She landed and spun knife out. The boar moved sideways, doing its best to keep Nezeru trapped against the edge of the precipice. Vegetation was so sparse here that she knew if she was forced over the edge, she would find nothing to grab, nothing to arrest her fall all the way down to the stony beach. Still, leaping over the huge beast had barely worked the first time. If she tried it again, her belly or her leg might well be torn open by one of those deadly ivory scythes. She quickly checked the distance to the cliff's edge behind her, then crouched, knife extended now, tracking the boar's head from side to side. Nezeru decided she would go for the animal's eye, or perhaps if she was lucky and avoided the first slash of the tusks, make a quick attempt to rip open the belly or the throat. Are you sure you want this, little mother? she asked. I would not take your life except in defense of my own. The angry red eyes gave no hint of similar sentiments. The wild sow shook her head and let out another grating bellow. An instant later, the huge pig was thrown sideways to the ground as if struck by lightning. It let out a shrieking squeal that sounded like the terror cry of a thinking being then began to crawl unsteadily away toward the undergrowth, dragging a long spear shaft through the bloody dirt. Keme, one of Nezeru's fellow sacrifice warriors, strode forward and set his booted foot on the sow's ribs to yank his spear free. The boar screamed again and its legs kicked, but he seemed to have torn a hole in its guts, and the animal's last struggles ended quickly. He wiped the head of his spear on the bristling hide, then looked up at Nezeru with poorly hidden distaste. The ship is here, he said. Chieftain Mako orders you down to the beach. He set his spear on his shoulder, turned, and walked away without a second glance at the twitching animal. But what about the boar? said Nezeru after a moment, when her surprised, swirling thoughts had turned back into words. We have enough to eat. Keme was clearly displeased to have to explain himself to a younger sacrifice. 
A war hand, especially one made up of the queen's talons, does not drag food around with them as helpless mortals do. But there will be mortals manning the ship, she said. Surely they can find some use for the meat. She did not know if she could carry the dead beast back down the hill by herself, but she was willing to try. It was better than wasting it. Keme did not even bother to look back at her. Leave it, he said. The ship was anchored far out in the bay. As Nezeru reached the bottom of the cliff a few paces behind Keme, a longboat rowed by a half-dozen bearded men was already nearing the beach. She had no real fear of mortals, but simply seeing so many of them together lifted her hackles. Their hand chieftain Mako was speaking with Ibikai of the Order of Echoes, but Nezeru kept her distance, in no hurry to be reprimanded for dallying on the hilltop. She was wondering where the fifth member of their hand had gone when she felt a presence behind her, as though someone or something was about to touch her. She whirled, drawing her knife again. The blade stopped an inch short of the half-blood Saumeji's throat. The magician did not blink or lift a hand to defend himself, but his pale lips curled in an expression that might have been amusement. We could not find you was all he said. Unlike the rest of the Talons, the singer did not wear his cloak with the black side out, now that they had left the snows, but continued to wear the white as proudly as if he were in the singer's order house back in Nakiga. For someone who is as much of an outsider as Nezeru was, Saumeji never seemed to fear setting himself apart from the rest of the company. Thank you, hand brother, she said, making her words as neutral as possible. She was determined not to give him undue respect, although she feared him, as she feared all his order. No, it was because she feared him that she would give him nothing. I was only atop the cliff, watching for the ship. Saumeji held her gaze. He had strange golden eyes, though his skin was as white as that of any pure blood. Traitor's eyes, they were called back in Nakiga, because the eyes of the Sithi, the Norns' kinfolk, were that same color, though the two tribes had, been go had gone their separate ways for a very long time. Such ancient features were scorned among the Hikidaya, even though they predominantly occurred in the oldest clans. As another half-blood, Nezeru wondered how much Saumeji had suffered for having a mortal parent. Even to ask him, though, would be to create a kind of intimacy in which she had no interest. As she and Sao Meiji joined the others, Mako stared at her so hard it made her uneasy, his eyes as unfeeling as a hunting eagle's. Nezeru had admired him since she had first joined the order, and had always done her best to emulate his pure-mindedness and his mask of stony indifference, but she feared that no matter how hard she tried, the human side of her heritage would keep her from being accepted by him or the others as true Hikidaya. Half-bloods were plentiful now in Nakiga, and they always matured far more swiftly than their pure-blood counterparts, though they seemed to live nearly as long. Nezeru had become a death-sung sacrifice at an age when her untainted peers were scarcely ready to join an order, let alone be granted its highest honors. But the confidence of the insider could never be hers. She was half-mortal, and her father, though important, was not even of the order of sacrifice. Only deeds could overcome such a heritage and lift her out of the crime of her diluted blood. The rowers pulled their longboat up onto the strand. Like most mortals who live near the ocean here in the north, they look to be of Rimmersgard blood, but unlike their kinfolk farther south, who had long ago given up the seafaring life, these so-called black Rimmersmen still made their living upon the, water, uh, upon the water, trading along the coast and even harrying and robbing any ships of other nations that strayed too far out of safe southern waters. 
But that was not the only reason these people were scorned by their Rimmersgaard kinsmen. The black Rimmersmen had been bound up with the Hikidaya for centuries, many of them captured and kept like animals, forced to labor for their Hikidaya masters. Slave or free, though, they were usually hated as turncoats by their own mortal kind. At a sign from Mako, the queen's talons climbed silently into the boat, and the staring, clearly frightened mortals rowed them out to the waiting ship. The captain of the Pringleit, a gray-bearded mortal with a face browned and cracked by the elements, tried his best to act as though these passengers were nothing unusual. But Nezeru knew that there had been little direct contact between the coastal lands and Nakiga since the end of the Storm King's War decades ago. These mortals might even have convinced themselves they were no longer the queen's slaves. Until Mako and the rest of the Talons appeared in the coastal village and demanded passage to the outer northern islands. The thought filled Nezeru with sour amusement. The captains certainly seemed to know these waters well because they sailed through the night. As the dark hours passed and Nezeru watched, the stars wheeled across the sky overhead in their familiar constellations, the gate, the serpent, the lantern, and the owl, as if they had come to remind her that no matter where she voyaged, she was still beneath the protection of the garden. When morning came, the land had utterly disappeared, and everything beneath the gray sky was water. Nezeru slept for a while without closing her eyes, letting her thoughts drift. She rose back to awareness to find the sun higher in the sky, but still far from its noon prominence. A short distance away, her chieftain, Mako, was sharpening his witchwood sword, cold root, against a polishing stone. She had watched him do it a hundred times since they had left Nakiga in the previous moon, and still it fascinated her, the rigor of his attention, the unshakable sameness of his actions. The sword was well worth the care, of course. Was The sword was well worth the care, of course, a blade of impeccable lineage. Fellow sacrifice Keme had once told her, in tones of veneration, that it had belonged to a brother of Ekimeniso himself, the queen's revered but long-dead husband. More recently, it had been wielded by one of Mako's nearer kin, General Sunoku, the beloved hero who had died in the Nakiga siege. Nezeru did her best to watch, without too much obvious staring, it was a very bad time to break their leader's attention. Mako had slapped Ibikaya's face once for coughing when cold root was unsheathed. As she watched the chieftain's long, pale fingers moving across the blade, she found herself almost falling into the pattern of the witchwood, its gray lines like whorls on a fingertip, so delicate as to be almost invisible. Each witchwood sword was as individual as its wielder, the pattern of the grain differed with each tree. Even discounting ornament, no witchwood sword would ever be the same as another. They were rarer than ever now, since witchwood itself was ever more scarce. Nezeru had heard whispers that the groves were lifeless places now, that only a few of the trees still grew, and that these had been moved for safety's sake to a garden inside the royal palace. Some of the whispers even said that these last trees were dying, too. Nezeru thought that such a loss would almost be a greater tragedy than the ancient dispossession of her race from the garden, or the evils that mortals had done to them in these new lands. The people still survived, and if they were strong, the Hikidaya might last until the world itself was unmade. But with the witchwood gone, there would never be another sacred blade smithied. The great damaged gates of Nakiga would never be properly rebuilt. Old witchwood could not be forged anew. When it was broken, the spells were unbound, and it became no different than any other object of the weary mortal earth. 
And I think we're going to stop there because we're starting a new section um, after this. And that would be confusing um, to get half a uh, 30 seconds into it and then have to quit. Um, so here, let me just throw this on here. So there we go. It is now just about eight o'clock um, in this new Pacific Daylight, no, Pacific Standard Time world. I just loathe and detest daylight savings. It's just an unnecessary confusion, but apparently there was some use to it at one point um, in terms of farming and the Second World War and things like that. And so I'm, I'm not going to make broad statements about how it's stupid or useless, but it, it's time for it to go, methinks. Um, anyway, not important. What is important is that I will be back next week yeah, don't know why not. I will be back next week, same Tad time, same Tad channel, to continue reading, and we will learn about some of the other people of Ostenard, um, whom we have not met before this point in The Witchwood Crown in any of the other books. So um, before we do that, um, as I said, a week will pass. I will be back next week for the same rough times. Until then, take good care of yourselves, take good care of your friends and loved ones and help out your neighbors and we will all manage to get through together somehow. Um, I'm convinced of that. I may be completely wrong, but that is a hill I am willing to die on or at least to get kicked in the shin on. So with that, I say peace, be well, talk to you real soon. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. I always appreciate it.